So uh, good morning and welcome to Bethel Church on this uh, very beautiful Sunday morning. And this is a time to celebrate and a time to um, wait as today is actually the first Sunday of Advent. And so we have just a couple things that we want to sort of draw your attention to. And so the first thing is that the next month, instead of the Sunday school videos that I know we've all loved and seen, we're going to have Advent Video still done by actually the Sunday school teachers and storytellers. So that's going to be what we're going to be doing for the next month as we're leading into Christmas and as Advent starts. And so, yeah, so right now I just would, uh, yeah, uh, direct your attention to the video as we learn about the first Sunday of Advent. To hold hope. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 45. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Some days it can feel like everything we know is difficult. We know we've been deeply affected by a virus that spreads rapidly and particularly attacks the most vulnerable, though no one is immune. We know there is sickness in our systems too. Racism, sexism, and nationalism that poison each of us and our effort to live together. We know our climate revolts against our abuse of it, fights back with raging fire, flooding water, and devastating winds. We know there is so much at risk at this moment. When the weight of all that we know is bearing down on us, it makes sense that we feel overwhelmed, angry, scared. But what don't we know? We don't know what the lasting effects of all the energy and love poured out will be. We don't know how our efforts to care for each other creatively will continue even after we've returned to old routines. We don't know how all the energy in the streets, all the learning done online, all the art created in response to the heartbreak and loss might form building blocks of the kingdom we sing and pray for. There is so much hope in what we do not yet know. Imagine Mary, and Elizabeth, bellies round, babies leaping inside them. Imagine all that those women do not know. They don't know what to think of that angel who brought greetings and a message of God's favor. They don't know why they've been chosen for these roles. They don't know who their babies will become, though they have some hints. They don't know how being mothers will change them. They don't know how their children will change the world or how the world will change their children. They don't know how their hearts will expand, ache, swell, and break for the children they carry now. 
They don't know whether their community will rally around them or run them out of town when they see this older woman and this young girl, both heavy with the hopes and dreams of their people, neither exactly who people would have expected, perhaps, to play these parts. They also might not know where they'll put another body or how they'll feed another mouth or if they'll ever get a full night's sleep again. They might not know how contagious their baby's giggles will be, how sweet their tiny toes will seem, how thrilled they'll be to hear their first words. But they know each other. They are excited for each other. They know that somewhere wrapped in all this unknown is an extraordinary gift. In their confusion and anticipation, they find each other and they bless each other for what's to come. All they have in an invitation to the life ever changing as they live each day and an instruction to not be afraid. All they know is that the same instruction God's given God's people all throughout their history. Do not be afraid. While they may have been afraid, they held hope that God would be faithful right by their side throughout this journey. Perhaps this Advent, the weight of all that we know is bearing down on us. And perhaps God gives to us this year the same gifts Mary and Elizabeth received so long ago. An invitation, an instruction, and the hope held in all that we do not yet know. So at this time too, we look to light the first candle, a candle of Advent. And as, as we're waiting in the season of anticipation, we just want to hold hope. And so I encourage us today as, as we hold to that, as we hold to the hope that is Jesus Christ and in this time of waiting. So I would just uh, encourage you right now at, at home and here to stand if you're able as we worship our God and as we sing about uh, and, and cry out, say, come thou long expected Jesus.
church is singing out, come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins, release us, let us find our rest in thee, come thou long
morning, Bethel Acton. My name is uh, Bart Eisen. I am the youth pastor at Bethel Christian Reformed Church in Listowel, and I am very happy to be with you this morning. As we come into God's house, we are instructed and called to worship. Psalm 105, verses 1 to 4 says this Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength and seek his face always. Let's seek his face this morning. Let's worship the God of all creation. Pray with me. God, I thank you for the opportunity to come to your house to worship here for those that could make it here. God, I thank you that many of us can worship in our homes despite these challenging times. God, I pray that wherever we are, we would engage you in this time. That we would be receptive to what you are going to speak through the word. That we would be receptive to a time of your refilling, of your encouragement through worship. God, but most importantly, we pray that we would glorify you with the words of our mouths, that we would worship you not only by singing, but in our hearts as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to God's house this morning, God greets us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Amen. Thank 
destroy you are the Lord of all the one who calms the winds and waves and makes my heart be still though the earth gives way the mountains move into the sea the nations rage but I know my God is in control Oceans roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Though the earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage, I know my God is in control. Lord, I'm close to in the fire with us as a shelter with us in the storm you will lead us through the fiercest battle oh where else would we go with the Lord of hosts Lord of hosts you're with us with us in as a shelter with us in the storm you will lead us through the fiercest battle oh where else would we go with the Lord of Our Bible reading is Matthew 25, 14 to 30. But before we read, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Matthew 25, 14 to 30, the parable of the bags of gold. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
God's Word is good. This is actually a passage that I'm very passionate about and one that I'm excited to share with you. Um, has anybody ever heard of the term adrenaline junkie or thrill seeker? Just raise your hand. Have you ever heard those terms before? Yeah, that's a, a term that, that kind of describes a person who has a compulsive desire for excitement and adventure. In fact, Google describes a person like this as someone who's an example of someone who has no concern for their own personal safety. We may have friends that fit this bill. We may, in fact, ourselves fit this bill. When I think of adrenaline junkies, I think about those YouTube videos or videos that you see on social media where um, people are doing all sorts of radical things. In one video, there's this guy who lays on the top of a skyscraper and he holds out his hand and has his friend, his friend's hand is, is in his fist and he's holding him over the edge of a building. That looks terrifying to me. Or I think about those people that get in those winged suits, jump out of planes, and they weave through all sorts of obstacles in these winged suits and land on the ground. I think of people like the people in, the, in England who actually do what's called tombstoning, where they jump off of cliffs straight as an arrow into the water below with no safety gear. And these cliffs are very high. When I think of adrenaline junkies, I think of people who go bungee jumping and skydiving. The thing about adrenaline junkies and thrill seekers is they do a lot of these things at great risk. There has been a number of inner injuries with things like tombstoning, and there's been a number of deaths as well. And they do all of this because of the adrenaline burst that it provides, that these thrill-seeking thrill behaviors provide. In our text today, we're going to look at a parable that encourages, or we have looked at a parable that look, encourages risk-taking. But not for an adrenaline boost, but for something more important and rewarding than any adrenaline boost could offer. You see, Matthew's gospel is very much focused on the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is the person who inaugurates the kingdom of heaven. And he brings it about during his time on earth. He also talks about when it will come to its end or completion. When it will be fulfilled, more like, on earth. And he uses parables to describe what the kingdom of heaven is like. Up until this point, Jesus has used a number of parables to illustrate the fact that we have no idea when he will return. And we're not to try and predict it, because only the Father knows when Jesus will return. In another parable, we're instructed to wait for God's return and to be ready for his return. In this particular parable, we're instructed as to what we should be doing when we wait for Jesus' return. Many of us have heard this parable a variety of times. The scene opens with a master who's about to go away on a long journey. But before he goes, he takes his wealth and he entrusts it to his servants based on their ability. In Luke's account, the master encourages his servants to make a return on their investment. In Matthew's account, this is implied. Now, the amount that he gives to these servants is not pocket change. The Greek word talenta in this passage, translated in the NIV as bags of gold, refers to a talent. And a talent is equivalent to 20 years of full-time wages. Wow. So the first servant, he's giving 100 years of wages. To the second, he's giving 40. And to the third, he gives 20. Usually, when we do a sermon, we start at the beginning of the text, and we work our way through the verses, which would mean that we would focus on the good servants first. But today, I'd like to reverse that order. I'd like to take a look at the servant who only had one talent. This servant was clearly afraid of his master. He has the idea in his head that his master's a hard man. Now, the word hard there could be translated rough or harsh. He thinks that his master is dishonest because he accuses him of reaping where he did not sow. He also believes that his master expects too much from him and that he will be punished greatly if he loses his master's money. You see, this servant sees himself as a victim of a bad situation. But in truth, in some sense, this master, this servant is acting wisely 
prudently, in fact. You see, the rabbis of this time would say, the best thing to do with your gold is to bury it in the ground. Because Jews were not permitted to loan out money with interest. Also, if he had put his money or tried to invest his money or put it with the bankers, there was a great chance that it would get stolen or robbed from him. What's interesting about this parable is that the master doesn't agree with the servant's approach, despite the conventional wisdom of the time. He calls this servant lazy, and he punishes the servant on account of his victim mentality and fear-based reaction. Now, we may be tempted to think about this passage and think to ourselves, man, this master sounds cruel. He sounds harsh. He sounds kind of mean. But the truth is that all indicators of this passage suggest that the servant misjudged the master. We can see by the way the master treats the other servants that he is in fact very kind and generous. You see, this servant is guilty of three things. Misjudging his master, like I said before, operating out of fear, and being lazy. You see, if he truly knew the master, he would, knew, he would know what a great opportunity he's been given. What trust is being demonstrated by the master. He would also know that the master would reward him for his efforts. And this servant shouldn't have feared the world and feared that his money would get stolen. He should have feared his master in a way that leads to relationship. But instead, he played it safe. And as a result, the master shows the servant the very wrath he was afraid of. He takes a talent from him, sends the servant away to a place of darkness and despair, and severs the relationship with the servant. I have a confession. Though I am a youth pastor, I hate roller coasters. They freak me out. And that's unfortunate because youth pastors often go to theme parks. I would rather sit in the Starbucks by the gate the whole time than go on many of the rides. I even tried the teacup ride and I was like sick after. For me, roller coasters are no fun, but largely because of what I think when I'm on roller coasters. I remember the first and only time I'll ever go on the behemoth. I get in this ride and the whole way up I'm thinking to myself, okay, there's this tiny little lap harness. I don't know if it's supposed to keep me in there. Like I'm a big dude and we're going really fast at really crazy heights. That doesn't look safe. Now, if you've been on the behemoth, you know there's parts of that track where you actually don't see the track in front of you, depending where you are on the ride. And then during those moments, I'm like, I don't know if we're flying in midair right now. We could be plummeting to our death. I have no idea. I'm thinking to myself, how strong are these wheels? Are they really going to support me? My friends on the ride, they're sitting there playing cards so they can catch it on the camera. And I'm over here freaking out, clutching this thing like I'm going to die. And they're like, dude, relax, relax. I'm like, no, nobody should relax on this kind of ride. We're screaming at a very fast rate down a track in, at a very high height. Nobody should be relaxed. This is terrifying. There is too much risk here. And I kept thinking to myself, why do I do this? Like, why did I get on this thing? Why would I take this risk? And the truth is, we as Christians have a tendency as well when it comes to our faith to play it safe, to do the wise and prudent thing. However, God did not give us the gospel message and the secrets of the kingdom to prioritize, sorry, to bury them in the ground. Too often, we, just like the Pharisees, focus too much on minor details. We're concerned about how we appear to one another, how we appear to God, instead of being focused on mission and sharing the gospel message. Now, hear me on this. I am not saying it's wrong to pursue holiness. I am not saying it's wrong to appear holy and to live holy. What I am saying is sometimes we get so preoccupied with those things that we forget that we were asked to share the gospel message. That we were asked to share the gospel message so that other people could come to know God and glorify Him. We too often focus on good things over and above better things. There's a variety of reasons for this reaction. Maybe just like the servant, we have false ideas about the master or God, and we have poor theology. Maybe we think we need to earn God's favor by obeying all the rules, or we believe that God is being cruel by forcing us to share this message we've received. Maybe we don't trust God's power enough or don't believe enough that he could empower us and enable us to bring the elect to himself. 
Sometimes, unfortunately, we in the reform camp have twisted and abused our doctrine to cause us not to be missional. We've thought to ourselves, God brings those who are destined for salvation to himself, and he doesn't need us to do this. And though it's true he doesn't need us, he for some reason uses us and chooses to use us to bring the elect to himself. We use it as an excuse. We say God can do it without us instead of doubling the seed planted in us. We tend to bury our faith in the ground. Maybe it's not just bad theology that causes us to keep the gospel message to ourselves. Maybe we fear the world too much. We're scared that if we take risks and share the gospel, we'll face persecution. We might fear that we'll lose friendships or be labeled a bigot. Maybe we're scared of other Christians. Maybe we think if we share our faith, the people around us will call us Bible thumpers or holy rollers or judge us slightly. Maybe we're worried that living missionally will put us at odds with the people around us and we may get hurt. Or perhaps we simply don't care enough about being missional. The idea doesn't appeal to us because we've not fallen in love with God and the gospel message to the point where we're motivated to share it with the people around us. Maybe we've become too apathetic and don't care enough to be distracted from our lives and the worldly pleasures that we can pursue. Maybe we're not even aware of how comfortable we've gotten, and we'd rather spend time on our hobbies like watching Netflix or relaxing on the couch to watch a movie or play video games instead of being missional, instead of doing the work that God's placed before us. Now, of course, again, none of these things are bad things, but they need to be done in an appropriate order and with appropriate balance. Maybe we've been so caught up by the comforts of our lives that we haven't felt propelled to share the gospel. Maybe we've gotten lazy. Whatever the reason, we who call ourselves Christians need to recognize that God is calling us to take risks for the kingdom. We must avoid the pitfalls of the wicked servant. But how? You see, the wicked servant paints a picture for Christians of what not to do while we're waiting for Christ's return. Alternatively, the good servants model what it means to effectively live for Jesus. Now, the good servants are giving, given differing amounts based on their abilities. And some have struggled with what those abilities could refer to. Are they natural abilities? Are they learned abilities? Are they spiritual gifts? I think they're all of the above. And we've, they've questioned what are the talents referring to. And I think that's the gospel message and the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But in any case, both of these servants were faithful with what they were given. The text says that they went immediately or at once to do work with the talents they were entrusted with. Unlike the wicked servant, these men know what an opportunity they've been entrusted with. And they capitalize on it. They get to work getting a return on the money entrusted to them. They're not crippled by fear. They're not waiting around for the master's return. They know how serious the task is, and they are planning to be ready. They feel empowered by the resources they have been given, and they trust the goodness and character of their master and go about their work joyfully. Now, it's easy to focus on how good the good servants are. Wow, look at these people. They must have had extensive gifts and abilities and godly character to be entrusted with so much but that's focusing on the wrong character. See, the center of the show is the master. His character and, good, uh, and his actions are what inspires good behavior from these servants. You see, if the wicked servant was right, these two other servants would do the same thing. They would hide their money, and they would have no motivation to do anything good for a wicked master. But they know that this master is good, and they honor their master by getting to work. And the rest of this story, of course, proves this sentiment to be true. What happens when the master returns? He lavishes praise and encouragement on those that have gotten a return on his investments. He rewards them by allowing them to keep the money they've been given, and he gives them more responsibility. And he says that they are invited to share in his happiness. Now, at first, we're thinking to ourselves, okay, if we're adults and we're running a business and we're busy or even students with too much homework, we're thinking to ourselves, okay, more responsibility, 
no thank you, I don't need more responsibility, I don't need, more ener- need to ex- uh, expend more energy. But Jesus is hinting at something pretty profound in this parable. He is suggesting that doing the work of advancing the kingdom is a joy-filled task. A joy-filled task. It's not meant to be tedious. It's fulfilling and good. You see, these servants have become partners with God in building the kingdom of heaven. They get to share in the joy of seeing that kingdom come to fruition. Come to greater strength on this earth. They get to see the work that God's doing and to recognize that they've been a part of it. And if this parable connects to any of the other parables on the concept of the kingdom, they're also getting to feast with him and to share in his master's happiness and wealth. You see, they get to see the riches of what it is to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. The master gave these servants the power they needed to do the work for the kingdom. He gave them purpose. And purpose is something that's hard to come by on this earth. He gave them goals that would result in more worth celebrating. Not only did he empower them and gave them purpose, he rewards them as if they were princes. Being the child of immigrants, uh, we used to have guests come over from Europe every summer. And uh, there were certain things that we had to do if it was your first time in Canada. The first thing, and I don't understand it, was we got to hit up a KFC. I don't know if it's just not in Europe or something or what the deal was, but my parents were like, you got to try this. I don't get it, but we had to do that. That was the first thing. The second thing we would do is we'd go to Niagara Falls. That makes sense. It's beautiful. And the third thing we'd do is go to the CN Tower. Now, ordinarily, uh, they would do these things while I was at school and I wasn't invited on these trips. But I remember one time uh, I was invited. And I remember rushing up to the top of the CN Tower and going to that glass floor. You guys know the floor I'm talking about where you can see through and see the ground? I like run up to that thing and I'm like right at the edge and I look down and I'm like, yeah, no, not stepping on that glass. Glass is not that strong. I would fall right through. Not going to do it. My dad, he sees me run up to the edge of this glass and he's like, hey, that glass is super thick, like really thick. You could jump on it and you'd be fine. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I like touch the glass hesitantly, start like walking on it, jumping on it by the end of it. I'm just testing it to see if I could actually fall through by the end of my experience on that glass. You see, it's amazing what a bit of trust and a bit of understanding does in a situation like that. The true reality behind this story is that I trusted my dad. I knew that I could act on the intel that he provided. I knew that I could step on that glass. So it is with Jesus in this parable. We as Christians are being asked if we trust Jesus enough to share the gospel message we've been given. Do we truly trust that we are empowered to see a return on Jesus' investment of the Holy Spirit in us? Do we trust that God is good and we will see a reward for our efforts? You see, God has given us all the talents of the gospel message. Through the Holy Spirit, he's enabled all of us to use our gifts and abilities to partner in seeing the kingdom expand. Why? Because God is good, and he wants us to find purpose and meaning in the building of the kingdom of heaven. Could he do it without us? Sure. But instead, he chooses to use us because he knows it provides us with joy and purpose. And thankfully, we have an example that we can follow in doing the work of the kingdom. The ultimate example, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12 verses 1 to 2 sums it up well. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Jesus, 
for the joy set before him endured the cross. Part of the message of Christmas is the fact that Jesus came down to be like one of us. He came down so that he could see us be equipped to share in the work of the gospel. So that he could provide us with an example of how to share in the kingdom work. So that he could see many embrace redemption. Jesus found joy in seeing the kingdom of heaven expand. And that is what in part motivated him to redeem us. We can follow his example, his ultimate example, and experience the joy of building the kingdom of heaven. Why? Jesus, because Jesus is at work pioneering and perfecting our faith. Because of that, we can run the race. The truth is, is that being on mission for the sake of the gospel is very rewarding. The idea that this, is, this work is a joy seems counterintuitive, but when we share the good news of Jesus Christ with the people around us, we see a return on the efforts God has enabled us to put forth. It gives our lives meaning, and we share in the master's joy. Instead of saying a friendly hello to the neighbor we barely know and then moving on with our day, maybe we need to linger a little longer and have a conversation, build trust, build a relationship, and share the joy we have in Jesus with that person. Instead of hanging out with our friend group and not bringing up our faith at all, maybe we need to offer to pray for them, especially when they're experiencing crisis. If we find ourselves surrounded by only Christians, Maybe we need to pray that God would put people on our path that we can share our faith with. If courage is our problem and we don't know how to start a conversation about Jesus, maybe we need to pray that we would fall more in love with Jesus and the gospel message so that we can truly embrace what a joy it is to have our salvation and then be enabled to share the word of God. We need to pray that we would be enamored, in awe of the gospel message. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit would empower us in whatever way he sees fit to share the message of Jesus. And we have lots of examples of this in Scripture. Acts 16 is a prime example. Paul's going to Macedonia, and the Spirit says to him, No, I have another direction for you to go. You're going to go to Macedonia. Sorry, not Macedonia. Paul's going to Asia, and the Spirit instructs him to go to Macedonia. The Spirit guides mission. And that's very helpful, especially in these times, in these COVID times. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but it's harder to share our faith during this season. We can't just go up to somebody and start talking to them. We can't just go into their homes and invite them in for food. We can't hug them. We have to be more creative. And we need to lean on the Holy Spirit's empowerment for that creativity and the ability to share the gospel message we've been given. The thing is, as we do this, as we embrace this task, we'll find that there's a deep joy in sharing the gospel with the people that God, by his spirit, have, has prepared to hear it. We cannot be passive about our faith. We cannot keep it to ourselves. We cannot give in to fear or worldly desires. If we want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, we must take the talents of the gospel message and invest them. But we cannot do this on our own strength. We are too frail and too broken. We must fall in love with Jesus and allow that love to motivate our efforts. It is his love working through us by the Holy Spirit that will reap a harvest a hundredfold. We are empowered risk takers. Let's live out of that identity. Let's pray. God, we've been given a challenging word this morning. A word that's not easy to hear. A word that may stir fear in our hearts because we know how hard it is to share the gospel message, to get a harvest on the talents that you've given us. God, we pray by your spirit that we would remember the fact that you came down to earth and gave us an example. That's what Christmas is about. You provide an example. You came down and got into the messiness of our humanness to show us how to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. 
how to be a part of seeing that kingdom expand. God, where we are scared and living in fear, bolster us with the courage of your spirit. God, where we are lacking creativity and how to share the joy we have in Jesus, instruct us by your spirit. God, if we're struggling with apathy and the distractions of this world, light a fire in us by your spirit. Enable us, Jesus, by your power to share the gospel message, not only out of obedience and gratitude to you, but because we want to see our neighbors know you. And we want to be a part of seeing them embrace the joy of Christ. God, I pray that your gospel power would spread through Acton and beyond, through this church and through the churches around it. May your spirit work powerfully and mightily through this church. In Jesus' name. So I just invite you to stand if you're able today and worship with us and sing Jesus all for Jesus. Good morning. Will you join me in congregational prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, some days we wake up and we are on fire for you, eager to get up and start the day and move forward with purpose. Other days, it's an effort just to open our eyes. Lord, please meet us where we are today. More than ever, we need your presence in our lives. Open our spiritual eyes and ears to hear your voice and to see your goodness and love. We set up so many roadblocks between ourselves and you, Father. Lord, give us the desire to come to your throne room with confidence, 
like the good servants. We know your call to us is to come to you with our burdens, our sins, our fears, our concerns, our praises and worship and thanksgivings. When we understand our value and identity as your sons and daughters, it changes how we approach you. We can come unafraid, open and honest with no shame. There is no fear in your correction because it leads to a freedom we can only find in you. There is peace that does not make sense to this world and forgiveness that brings life and health and acceptance and love beyond measure. Lord, we are coming into the Christmas season and it's hard not to get caught up in the commercialism of the season and also the anxiety of how this Christmas will be different during COVID. Please keep our hearts tuned into you and your priorities this holiday season. Remind us again of what is important and what we are to honor. Give us inspiration and creativity to celebrate with family and friends, even though it may not include meeting together. And give comfort to those who may be lonelier this year. May they look to you first as their comforter and loving presence this Christmas, but also nudge our hearts to reach out a little more to our loved ones in our community this Christmas. We pray for those in our church family who are struggling physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Lord, you know them by name. And we pray for more of you, Jesus. You are the light of the world. Darkness cannot exist in the light. Jesus, we pray for your light in our lives. In the quiet, dark corners where we have lost or forgotten the good things from you, we pray for your light. In the closet where we've left things we just want to forget about, we pray for your light. In the places we have hidden shameful things, sometimes to be left, but sometimes revisited, we pray for your light. In the spaces we don't even realize are dark, we pray for your light. Lord, help us, free us, fill us, use us. When we have come to you, when we leave the darkness behind and pursue you instead of ourselves and the world, take our lives and use us for your glory. That is our purpose. That is freedom. That is joy. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. That was a beautiful, stirring prayer, uh, Caroline. Um, no, I'm actually going to ask you to stand at this moment, actually. Know that as we go from this place and we are placed with this call to go and share the talents that we've been given, that God goes with us and that we can run to him for strength and encouragement, just as Caroline said. Receive his parting blessing. May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So come on me faithful, joyful and triumphant. So come me, oh come me, 
Adore. 